All right, well, thanks to everyone for joining me. I know that there's like a bunch of different sessions going on and like I'm having a hard time planning what I wanna do. So I'm glad that you've come to this. Uh, if you wanna follow along, you can grab the slide deck at my speaker deck uh, personal page. Um, little disclaimer at the beginning, this is gonna be a little bit of a novice presentation. Um, so if you're a black belt in scikit-learn, or pandas, like you might not get a whole lot out of this. I, I promise I've sprinkled some things throughout the presentation like so everyone will get something out of this presentation, but this is really meant for, um, I don't know, beginners or novices to this kind of stuff. No problem. <laughs> So what does the presentation look like? Uh, the meat of the presentation will be f three flavors of a logistic regression. Uh, before we get to that actual patty, we've gotta do a little bit of preamble. So I've got an introduction, um, some motivation, and data creation. So the bun, uh, just a little bit more about me. I work for a company called Borrowwell, which is a FinTech company in Canada. Uh, we've been around since 2015. And essentially, we help Canadians make great decisions about their credit. So we launched in 2015 with a personal loans consolidation product uh, where you can borrow up to $35,000 at like 5.6% APR, and this is meant for people to consolidate their expensive credit card debt. Just last year, we uh, launched a product where we were giving away credit scores for free. This was the first time in Canada, um, and it's really kind of cool. We've got 250,000 users now, and we kind of wrapped up those two different products and have helped one of the big, biggest banks in Canada, CIBC, whose uh, mascot is that Percy Penguin there. So CIBC has eight million customers and we help um, deliver these two products to kind of a broader audience. Essentially, it, what I'm getting at is like we're an incredibly data-rich company. I'm so happy and thankful for the data that I do get to play with. But essentially, what I do in my day-to-day -day job is a classification problem. Uh, it's predicting yes and no. It's predicting if we give you money, will you give that money back to us? Uh, so I wanted to rewind just a little bit and kind of explain how I got to borrow in the first place because it kind of sets up this presentation nicely, I think. Um, this path might be familiar to a lot of you, but when I started my professional career, I was essentially a spreadsheet jockey. So I was creating uh, VLOOKUPs, pivot tables, um, and this was all primarily done in Excel. Back in 2013, um, word clouds were all the rage, and I remember one of my bosses coming to me like, hey, Max, can you do one of those like cool word clouds? I was like, yeah, I can probably figure that out. Uh, and so I figured out that R was like a really good tool to do that. Um, I still kind of used Excel in most of my work and most of my data analysis, but then one day I was thrown a data set that was like a gigabyte big, and like, oh my goodness, how am I gonna throw Excel at this problem? And like, it just kept breaking and shutting down, it wasn't working. Um, so this is when I got like really deep into R. And you sort of discover that like, R is kind of a language that is Excel without the mouse on steroids. Uh, <laughs> and so, I kind of have matured to the point where I'm doing type A data science and type B data science. These are just two different varieties for the A meaning like you're now analyzing. So if you do data discovery or like you're presenting insights to management, you'd probably use like a type A uh, data science workflow. But I'm also kind of merging over and doing a lot of more type B work with this is the real machine learning stuff. Um, and more recently, I'm building out microservices for Borrowell to kind of deliver real-time machine learning uh, products back into our regular application flow. And so right now, my stack kind of looks like this. Uh, I use R for my type A stuff, a little bit of the type B, but if I need to do building and real work, that's what Python is for. And so I don't necessarily see the two languages as substitutable. Um, if you guys are familiar with R, you're probably familiar with the tidyverse and like everything that Hadley Wickham has created. Uh, like I adore the guy. And I use all of these packages kind of in tandem with my workflow in Python. So moving more into the Python specific stuff, if I need to build a model, if I need to deliver that model, I'll probably use like Keras or Scikit-learn, or I'll use Bottle and Flask to actually deliver that stuff. 
So this is what my path kind of looks like. It's not exactly linear, although I went from Excel to R to Python. I'm kind of like rotating back and forth in between Python and R. I, I don't want to get rid of the R stuff that I've built up because like I find that it's just, it's better for plotting. It's better for web scraping. I'm sorry, I'm sorry if I'm going to start a flame war, but like I, I just really love to rely on R for the simple stuff. When I was moving a lot of my stack over to Python though, um, there were some hiccups. So you get used to R, you get used to the way things are done, and I was kind of looking for some of those bridges that allowed you to move fr your stack from R to Python. And I noticed that Patsy, uh, the library actually sponsored by PyData, is like incredibly good for that kind of stuff. So, we're nearly to the code. Before we get there, um, I'm sick and tired of people showing Iris data sets as their like hello world example. Um, so I thought we'd do a little bit something fun. Today is actually Canada's 150th anniversary. I'm super bummed that I'm not gonna be there for it. Um, so if there are any Canadians in the crowd, like come talk to me and let's like figure out how to celebrate tonight. Um, but essentially I wanted to build out a data set that would kind of celebrate Canada Day. So let's imagine that there's a pool of migrants. There's a thousand of them. They can either choose to go to Canada or to the United States. And if you go to Canada, you get a one. So this is just a classification problem. It's the stuff that I do every day. Um, I would like to maybe show you some of the loan examples, but like you guys probably wouldn't, it's, it's kind of boring. I love to talk about it, but like this I think will be a little bit more exciting. And to make it more exciting, I've embedded in this data set certain characteristics. So if you like beer, um, you're gonna come to Canada, we've got great beer. If you like warm climate, so you're not gonna come to Canada, it gets quite cold, so you're gonna go to the States. And if you've got family in Canada already, you are probably gonna come to Canada as well. So let's get into this. Uh, if you're following along and you've grabbed the slides off my speaker deck, um, everything is meant to be runnable and I'm actually gonna post a link to my GitHub so you can actually run this stuff um, in a notebook, but here are the standard imports and here's how you actually create the data. So this is just a, a thousand different people. Uh, you're grabbing three different inputs, so beer, uh, whether or not someone likes the warm climates, and whether or not they have family. So beer and warm is from the normal distribution, family is just one and zeros. Uh, then I'm kind of building out that linear combination to like fake my data to have these certain characteristics. So someone is gonna come to Canada if they really like beer, don't like warmth, uh, and have family in Canada. So push that through the inverse logic function, and then I'm gonna fake out uh, kind of a categorical va variable at the very end. Does that make sense, everyone's following? So once we've created the data, we can stuff that into a pandas data frame, and this is what it looks like. So just examining a couple different rows, you've got on the first, or at index zero, someone who didn't come to Canada. So their love for beer wasn't all that high. Uh, they did have family in Canada, but they just like really loved warm climates, and so they went to, to the United States. Someone at index three uh, really loved beer, had family in Canada, or sorry, uh, didn't really like warm climates, but didn't have family in Canada, they still came to Canada. So this is what the data set looks like. Um, I'm gonna drop it out to CSV and actually plot it in R because like, I, I hate Matplotlib. Um, but essentially this, so you can like kind of feel what the data set looks like, this is what it looks like. Uh, so you've got importance of good beer on the x-axis, importance of warm climates on the y. You can see all the blues are people that went to the states, and all the reds are people that went to Canada. So now we're actually at the meaty part. Um, I said I was going to show you logistic regression in kind of three different flavors. I'll quickly speed through the R example, the Python, and then I'll actually talk about Patsy. So given that my job is trying to figure out, okay, we give you money, are you gonna give it back to us? I really like to start building my models with the logistic regression, uh, just kinda as that benchmark. Like it's super interpretable, super easy to build, super easy to explain, um, especially if you're trying to sell this stuff to investors, they can understand a logistic regression. Because like it's just one step uh, above like a linear regression, like y equals mx plus b, you can't get any more basic than that. 
So this is what the flow looks like in R. Uh, I hope everyone can see that. Essentially, when you open up your uh, R Studio IDE or whatever text editor you have, you're gonna load up the tidyverse. Um, you should just always do that. We're gonna grab the data and then split it into our test and train sets. So I'm using caret to do this, and I'm just having my 80-20 split. Uh, in this next slide, we're actually gonna build, fit, and like just bake the model. And so this is it. <laughs> it's one line, uh, you're drawing from the general uh, linear model with family binomial, and you're describing the model in like this really elegant formula syntax. So, hey, I wanna build this logistic regression model predicting Canada on top of beer, warm, and family. Like, that's it, it's amazing. Uh, if you actually start to want to like diagnose this model and peek at it, what it does, um, you can see that it, this is the printout of the estimates for the coefficients, the p-values. If you want to go stargazing, they're like, oh, like, great, everything looks significant. If you want to predict on top of that model, uh, we're just going to grab the predict function with model and then our test data. And then to actually verify these findings, like this is not an exhaustive list, but here's one way you can do it. Uh, I'm just using a rock curve, so, and then calculating the area under it. Like I'm pretty happy with these findings. So this is the entire flow, pretty simple, uh, quite elegant, and the formula part is what I think is most important. So as I was moving a lot of my stack over to Python, given that I'm doing most of my machine learning in this kind of paradigm now, I ran through a couple of issues. And so here's the flow that I was trying to get to work, um, and it didn't quite work. So kind of one-to-one, -one, uh, we're gonna load up some modules, load in the data, and then this is where it kind of like veers off course if you're used to R and not Python. Um, you've gotta like create the design matrix with your X array and your Y output variable. You gotta like manually add an intercept, then actually like call in the model, and then, oh wait, no, it won't work because uh, you've got this categor categorical variable. Like that just was automatically working for you in R. So you gotta start again. Uh, so load up the models, the modules, load up the data. You've actually gotta like dummy the data. Uh, so use some one-hot encoding. Uh, now this is gonna work, so we're just gonna grab family equals yes, so do ones and zeros for that. Create the design matrix and add the intercept. And then, I actually really like this from scikit-learn, the train test split. Um, I think this is a really elegant way to do it. I, I wish R had something better than carrots create data, data partition. Uh, bring in the model, fit it, which is new, like that's a two-step process where an R was just one, I find that a little strange. And then you can kind of like peek at the results of, of this model and grab the same kind of coefficients and uh, p-values. So again, for review, this is what the R flow looks like, pretty elegant, I really love that formula syntax. Uh, the Python example, if you're doing this for the first time or you're moving your stack over from R to Python, is a little bit more confusing. There's like some hiccups that you've gotta get used to, um, especially creating that design matrix and especially like building the model and then calling fit. So <laughs> I think it kinda sucks and I'm not the only one. This is a really great uh, Twitter exchange that I just grabbed. So someone's complaining about logistic regressions and specifically about like diagnosing it and grabbing um, certain outputs. I love it because Jake Vanderplas actually chimed in on this thread and said, hey, if either R or Python were universally better, we wouldn't be having this discussion. And I think that's like especially true. But the most important thing in this thread is like, just this tweet right here, like, hey, uh, sorry to be aggressive, but I'm just trying to avoid R in this specific instance. And that's kind of like how I feel. I don't want to avoid R all times, um, but sometimes just to have everything in the same flow, everything in the same script, it's just better. And so, again, using logistic regression as a benchmark, I wanted to kind of like marry the R stuff with the Python and Patsy is just a really great way to do that. 
So Patsy, for those of you that don't know, is a Python library for describing statistical models. Um, it's building that convenience, or rather bringing over the convenience of our formulas to Python. So this is the GitHub page for it if you want to check it out. Basically to install pip install Patsy, super easy. And this is what the flow starts to look like. So bringing in the modules, so from Patsy import D matrices and build design matrices. That second part is important for actual predictions. Um, you're loading up the data, and then this is where the Python flow kind of, again, looks like that R flow that you might be used to. So I'm calling uh, D matrices, and I'm just describing what I want it to do. So hey, give me Canada on top of beer, warm, and family. Again, we're trying to predict uh, flows of migrants and whether or not someone's gonna go to Canada or in the United States. If they like beer, they're gonna come to Canada. Um, so, the one caveat, or rather, again, this is what the R example looks like. One caveat is you need to grab that Y output and kind of MP ravel it so that it plays nicely with the scikit-learn API. Kind of like got to flatten it out. Um, but then the flow goes back to maybe what you're used to in Python. So, grabbing the train test split, uh, actually modeling it. So grabbing logistic regression from scikit-learn linear model, and then uh, actually calling fit on your training data. To actually peek at the results of this model, you can do a bunch of different things. Um, traditionally, you'll probably grab the accuracy score or the rock score, or area under the curve score. Um, pretty happy with those results. You can also do uh, some cross-validation scoring, so you use like a, a tenfold validation Again, pretty happy with that stuff. Or you can output uh, your confusion matrices or your classification report. So this is, um, I think, pretty great. This is my first bonus. So those of you that are perhaps like a little bit more advanced are like, oh my goodness, like this is so basic. Um, I really love the elegance of a rock curve, but when you're trying to explain classification results to someone that maybe doesn't deal with this type of data every single day, this is confusing. Um, it might not really make sense to people. And so I'm an incredibly visual person and I like to show people things that they can like touch and feel. And so instead of a rock curve, if you're actually presenting this type of data, you can do what's called a separation plot. And so this is meant to show how well your model does in separating the ones and zeros. So bas basically you line up all your values um, your predicted values from zero to one, and then you color those on the true values. So you can see, oh, at the very tail end um, near the zeros, there were people that were predicted to go to Canada but never did. And so this model does pretty well in separation. If it was just like a completely random model, this is what it would look like. And so that separation plot function is just something I've built. I won't go through the code, but it's there if you want it. Maybe I should build this into a proper library. But essentially, you're just like rearranging the values um, in an ordered sequence and then building out some like matplotlib code. So again, I think this is a really elegant way to show your results to people that are maybe not familiar with this type of stack. So going back to the Patsy example, um, when we were actually building the design matrices, Patsy was doing a lot for free. It was kind of creating the matrices, but then it was actually dealing with the categorical variables for us. And so when we actually want to predict on top of this stuff, we need to call design info um, from the X, uh, array and actually start to like build out a function so that we can pr predict on top of that. So if you've got new data, let's stuff it into a pandas data frame, uh, build the design matrices from that design info and put in the new data, and then you can like return the probabilities of someone coming to Canada. So this is like Bob, he really likes beer, doesn't really care for warmth and has family in Canada. You throw those values into the Patsy predict function that we built right here. And so the output is, okay, hey, he's got a 99.8% probability of immigrating to Canada. This is like Jane, she do isn't, doesn't really care for beer, kind of likes the warmth, but has no family in Canada. So again, calling the Patsy predict function uh, with the design info that you're grabbing from uh, the x-ray that you created. Um, and then stuffing in the values and finding that, hey, she's only got a 14% chance of coming to Canada, so she's probably gonna go to the States. 
So this is what the flow looks like in its entirety. It's a lot more simple, a lot more elegant, and it's especially great if you want to show non-technical people your, your flow. Like, hey, this is that one line when I'm doing the work. Um, I'm gra grabbing Canada on top of beer, warmth, and family, and it's pretty great. So this is just kind of scratching the surface of what Patsy can do. Um, there's also some like really nice built-in functions where you can like do inlining, inline uh, data pre-processing. So the data that I was using was already kind of like pre-processed, so it's cheating a little bit just so we could I don't know, speed this example up. But if you want to like center or standardize your variables in kind of this formula syntax, um, you can do it really easily. And then if you actually want to grab interactions between your different data, so you've got inputs A, B, and you want the interaction of A and B, you can just describe it in this like really great uh, colon syntax. So to actually extend this example, because just Patsy is probably not enough, um, the Patsy maintainer, Nathaniel J. Smith, really wants to be Patsy, to have Patsy be like the bridge for people coming over to R, and so he's trying to have developers use it in their packages to make that process a lot easier. So think about like matplotlib, what that was. It was like trying to bring MATLAB people over to Python. Like I see Patsy in the same light. So if you're a developer, maybe use this stuff because you can kind of grow your audience. Um, and although the communities of Python and R don't really overlap, it would be nice to have like a little bit more cross-pollination because like the ideas in, in both communities are pretty great. Uh, this is my like lame attempt at using the Patsy library in like a simple uh, function. So I mentioned that I kind of hate matplotlib. Uh, I wanted just like an easy scatter plot, and so I can say, "Hey, give me Canada on top of beer and warmth," and like kind of plot that. This is kind of pathetic, though. Um, the PyMC3 people have actually taken Patsy and have done a lot better job in. Um, building out a more robust way to integrate these formulas into what they do. So for those of you that don't know, PyMC3 is a Python package for Bayesian um, statistics. Uh, I think everyone should be Bayesians, like talking about p-values and especially explaining p-values to like people that are non-technical is just like, it doesn't work. Um, if you can talk about like credible intervals and probabilities, that's something people like understand. But PyMC3 Pi has its own learning curve. And so what's really great is the developers of this library have actually built in Patsy in kind of this like from formula method call. So you can grab, hey, let's build this logistic regression in kind of this Bayesian paradigm and grab Canada and predict on top of beer, warmth, and family. Um, I'm not defining the priors, but you can, but I just find Patsy to be like a really great springboard to introduce um, people to the more complex like Bayesian statistics. So after you build that model, you can uh, draw from the pro series and see like what your weights are actually doing, uh, get some outputs where you're actually describing what the coefficients are and giving you the cred credible intervals, which are, which are just like way more easy to explain than confidence intervals. Um, but yeah, so in summary, uh, maybe your flow kind of looks like that, this, where you've come from Excel to R to Python and you don't want to give up R, or maybe like you're coming from Python and want to understand R a little bit better. And especially if you're a Python uh, developer and want to bring more people from the R community over, I think it's really important to like build these bridges and like figure out the next matplotlib to kind of migrate people over. Patsy, I've found, has been like pretty great for that. Um, I just want to give two thanks to Nathaniel J. Smith, who's the actual maintainer of this package, and for PyData and uh, NumFocus for having me here. Um, I hope you guys got like maybe something out of this presentation. Um, but yeah, that's pretty much it. If you want to find out more about me, I'm just Max Humber at all these places. And if you have kind of come over from R to Python, I'd love to hear your story and like how you've made that transition. And if you're Canadian or just want to celebrate Canada Day with me, like come talk. <laughs> so thank you.
aqui. Uh, so, so the question is like, can you do some more robust like mixed modeling with this type of thing? And I'm sure you can, it's just like the models that I'm building at work kind of don't really use logistic regressions. Like this is my benchmark and I'm kind of describing the model first and if it performs better than something that is like super easy to explain, I'll use those. Um, if you want to do that mixed modeling, I think PyMC3 has really great uh, ways to describe those kind of stacks and interactions, I, I'd refer you to their documentation. If you want to mix Python and R, why not just uh, call R from Python via R part two? Yeah. Uh, so the question is like, why not just call R from Python? And you're absolutely right. So in Jupyter Notebooks, there's a really easy like IPython magic to grab you from R and Python, or even calling it is easy. Um, I find that like, if I'm trying to deploy my models to like a, a development environment, um, just having it in this one flow just reduces um, a lot of overhead, uh, like that's maybe not the best example, but yeah, I, I'm just using now Patsy as a way to kind of bridge into these other technologies, especially PyMC3, and there's like Bambi and Edward that are making use of the same technology. So although this is like a pretty rudimentary example, it's like uh, your question could be, why not just like drop the data out into ggplot, and like I've done that, but like sometimes you just want to stay in the, the regular Python flow. I don't know, that's not a super great answer. <laughs> that, uh, if I remember correctly, you use R for the simple stuff. Could you elaborate on uh, simple in what way? Uh, simple in the way that I define it, maybe. Uh, so I really like R for plotting. Uh, ggplot is just, I think, really nice. Um, I really like R for web scraping. Um, especially like using Arvis, like I've tried Beautiful Soup, and although like you can get it to work, I find that it's more elegant in that kind of R paradigm. So if I'm just doing like simple toy examples, I'll do that. And if I need to um, explain model results or just like toy around with different ideas, I'll start in R and then maybe move over to Python. Okay. Well, I think that's the opposite perspective. In my view, historically, I mean the more complex models have been implemented in R much earlier, and also Python is getting there. You have to keep in mind that uh, the depth of implementation, taking care of all the corner cases and having not just machine learning, but like um, advanced time series models oftentimes, there's more in R. So my perspective was always uh, Python is a full programming language, so as soon as I do some productive programs, I use Python. I always thought that, well, for the advanced models, I would want to choose R. Yeah, I, I can't disagree with that. So the question is like, isn't R meant for more of that complex stuff? And yeah, probably. Um, but again, like, I really wanted to emphasize this talk as like a way to kind of get more of that cross-pollination. So if you're a Python person, um, Patsy might enable you to think about these R, uh, the ways that R designs and builds up these machine learning models. Like a lot of packages use this formula notation. Um, and if you're going the other way, thinking about Python in these terms is maybe helpful just to kind of make that click that, hey, you've, R does a lot for free. Um, if you want to create the design matrices, you've got to do it manually. Um, but I think like more cross pollination is great. Like I'm not doing advanced time series in R. Um, I have, but I just find that right now my flow is mostly Python because I'm building those uh, microservices and the machine learning models on top of that. That's just kind of where I'm at. 
Cool. Well, thank you guys.